Hey, welcome back to Home Studio Pro. Really appreciate you being here. And this time around, we'll tackle one of the most basic yet essential decisions you'll make in setting up your home environment. And that is what kind of microphone you'll want to be using. Now, in fairness, there are three types, including a ribbon mic. I'm not necessarily recommending one of those for you. So the decision comes down to either dynamic or condenser. And if you're not even sure what the difference is there, basically speaking, we'll dive into characteristics in just a second and explain that. But first, let me say it like this. My premise is that microphones are like golf clubs. And for somebody who doesn't know any different, they'll look at that bag of clubs and say, well, they all hit the golf ball. What's the difference? You pull out one, you hit it down the fairway, you pull out the next, you hit it closer to the pin, and you play golf. Well, You know it's not like that. You know that every club has a specific purpose because in the same way you wouldn't pull your driver out on the putting green, you also wouldn't pull out your putter to hit your tee shot. Obviously, right? So every single club has its different purpose and a really good top golfer has all the clubs they need, right? So you might have a condenser mic for some reason or you might have a dynamic for another reason. It depends on what you're trying to do, where you're trying to do it, and ultimately what you want to get out of the microphone, what you're trying to accomplish. So I hope that makes sense. I'm not here to say, oh, condensers are always better or dynamics are always better. There's a purpose for either one of these types of microphones. It just depends on who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. Fair enough? Okay. Let's get into some characteristics here, beginning with condenser microphones. And this is one, by the way, the Neumann U87AI. They come with lots of detail to the extent that you can really pick up every single thing of my voice. It does feel sharp. It feels, yeah, crisp. I put a crisp V curve there. We'll talk about frequency response in just a second. But even, like, listen to this. Like, if you... you, You leaned in there and you could hear just my fingers rubbing. It picks up all that detail to a high degree, something that a dynamic microphone just wouldn't do in the same way. These microphones usually come with a crisp curve. And by that, I mean on the high end, there's a presence boost, usually in the five to 10,000 hertz range. This microphone definitely has it. Other than that, it's mostly flat across the spectrum. I will say a lot of condenser microphones also do have a bit of a a bass boost on the low end, or they're very susceptible to proximity effect. And you can change the frequency response by uh, mic technique and getting a little bit closer to the microphone. So these condensers do offer you a little bit more on the top and bottom ends of the frequency curve than, say, typically dynamics. Now, I'm, I'm making this statement as a broad generality. You might find specific instances where I'm wrong here in comparing two specific mics I'm saying, generally speaking, that is the case. Condenser microphones always require phantom power. That's just their operating principle. That's their design electronically. They require some current to operate them and keep them going. You'll notice that if you turn phantom power off, this mic, it doesn't work. Now, it seems like this used to be a big deal 10, 20 years ago that not every mixer or interface or preamp could supply phantom power. But it does seem like in this day and age... That's commonplace, so we talk about it a lot. It's not a big deal. Just know, though, if you're using a condenser, it needs to be supplied with phantom power. Condensers are typically a little bit more fragile, right? You think about the the definition of a large diaphragm condenser. There is a significantly sized capsule in that mic. Now, it's not to say that I couldn't take this U87 out of the home studio, bring it somewhere else, record with it here or there. You could. I'm not planning to. I would also treat it very carefully if I did, but the bottom line is, generally speaking, these are not made for run-and-gun type activities, right? They're, they're meant to live in a certain spot. And then the last thing here about a condenser, very low self-noise, and a large part of that is how they are designed. They are powered. They operate a little bit differently. They are so much more sensitive, so they don't have to, how do I say this, listen as hard. They don't come with the built-in hiss so that when I'm quiet, the microphone is pretty quiet, except for whoever is mowing their lawn outside right now. Yeah, home studio problems. You feel me on that right there. Okay, dynamic microphone characteristics. They typically offer more rejection. Now, when I say rejection, I mean if I'm talking into the business end of this Shure SM7B, 
it's not going to hear as much on the sides or specifically like rear rejection. We talk about that a lot with dynamic microphones. So it kind of has the same cardioid pickup pattern, but it does seem to do a better job of not hearing things that are not directly in front of the microphone. Typically, frequency-wise, a little bit of a flatter tone, maybe not that same push on the high or low end. Again, this is generally speaking, some mics, some dynamics have a lot more presence than others. Like the RE20 has way more presence than the 7B, even when you flip that presence boost switch on in the back. These microphones do obviously need gain. Condensers do too, but they need 20 to 30 dB more gain, typically speaking. So just understand that the preamp you'll be using with a dynamic microphone feels like it's more important there than as opposed to a condenser. These mics are a little bit more durable. Again, I'm not planning to uh, to abuse my 7B or my RE20, but just know that uh, they do stand the test of time and usage just a little bit better. But they also do come with more self-noise. And again, it's just the way that they operate, the principle they operate on. There's, there's basically no power to this mic, so what it's hearing, it has to kind of hear it all by itself. Um, it, that's probably the most simple way that I can describe the operating principle. So those are characteristics of dynamic microphones. So let's get into use cases. When would you want to use a condenser? Eventually, when would you want to use a dynamic? Condenser use cases for me is any type of soft source. Like if I were doing voice acting and if I were doing some whispering and I've obviously taken my voice, you know, a lot lower here, uh, but I do have compression on. So it's it's countering that uh, if you're doing ASMR or yeah, voice acting, a lot of people for broadcasting, it just has a clearer tone. Now, a lot of times in broadcasting, you'll see the 7B or the RE20. So I know I'm going against myself, but I'm saying in treated spaces, which is part of my list here. A lot of times you're broadcasting from a treated space, they'll be using a condenser microphone. Uh, for stage, for promo, for VO, you know what I forgot to put in here is for music recording, right? For vocals on a track. You're almost, almost always using a condenser because of that detail that it picks up. Um, granted, the people who are shouters a lot of times, um, Metallica, for example, will be using the SM7B because this microphone can handle loud sources um, I would say a lot better, but it's it's preferable on louder sources versus a condenser microphone. But the big thing here is that I would really only be considering a condenser mic for your purposes in a home studio if there was some treatment to the space or it was an acoustically friendly space. If you're planning to record your podcast in a bathroom or in a long hallway, please do not use a condenser mic. It's only going to enhance the deficiencies of your recording space. Okay, uh, dynamic microphone use cases. Again, singing, and, and I, I say singing, but really shouting. And I don't, I don't want to draw the line here of, well, what recording artists use what microphone, dynamic or condenser. Generally speaking, I see a lot of condensers on, on vocals, but again, the, the singing and the yelling is where you start to get into more of a, a dynamic. Loud settings, if you were a PA announcer in a sports arena, yeah, I would not be using a condenser. I would be using a dynamic. Think about, uh, you know, noise rejection, side and rear rejection, plus the fact that you can basically eat this mic. You can be all over it, and it's still going to provide a good sound versus a condenser, which is so sensitive and picks up so much detail. It's plosive city, right? Even with a pop filter, it may not work out how I want it to. Some people will... Use their dynamic microphone in a less treated space. More on that and the ultimate golden rule to finish out my video. The dynamic is not your turnkey solution to fixing a bad treated room. Uh, long form narration. If I were recording an audiobook, to be honest, this microphone, uh, talking into it and hearing it back for 8, 10, 12 straight hours, it's a little too crispy. I would tend to defer to the 7B. And then for mission critical purposes, I mean, I really do think that, again, if you're bringing it somewhere, if I was going on a road trip, I uh, love the 87. I really do. Obviously, it's my everyday microphone, but the 7B or probably the RE20 or or the MKH416. Now, that is that is a shotgun mic, not a dynamic mic, but but it, the way that it's built, it's it's more of a mission critical microphone like all the dynamics are. OK, so that is pretty much the way I would sum up use cases for dynamic microphones. But let me get to the ultimate golden rule. 
I want this to sink in, right? That's why I've gone to the full screenshot. Don't think that a dynamic microphone is your ultimate fix for bad acoustics. If this room, right, if it did not have all the sound panels and treatment, and I'm trying to stop all the uh, the reverb, right? If it did not have this, a dynamic mic alone is not going to fix all of that. You really need to work on your room space, treating your room. If you want the best acoustics, the room has to be equal to the microphone you're using. A lot of times I hear people say, yeah, you know, I tried the Rode NT1, but it just didn't sound good in my room. So I went with the 7B and it fixed everything. It did not fix everything. It made it sound a little bit better. It, it, it did not expose your deficiencies of the room as much as the NT1 did. Um, but it's not your fix. Sure, sure. Can it improve things slightly? But again, you're you're not addressing the root of the problem, and that is your room acoustically. So you'll hear this a lot. Oh, you know what? Home studio, use a dynamic. And to, to a large extent, I mean, that is probably going to favor you best. But you know what really is going to favor you best if you're ultimately looking for the best sound is to treat your space and then get a condenser. Okay, but until then, yeah, a dynamic microphone more often than not is your better choice, but it's not the ultimate fix as a choice. Okay, hopefully we've gone through everything there, dynamic and condenser. And yes, you will also see there are ribbon mics out there, but for a lot of different reasons, design, operation, maintenance, I don't know that a ribbon mic, I could even suggest it to most people, like to 95% of people, 99% of people in a home studio, I'd say stick with a dynamic or a condenser. Let me know what you think about this video in the comments section below. Thumbs up, please, if it provided you some value, that would greatly help me out. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You made it here this long. You like this type of content. I've got lots more coming your way. And speaking of that, I'll see you next time.